All right, just so we kind of stay on time as he's scanning that, I'm going to go ahead and start. I want to, so I'm Ken Langdon. I'm a solutions architect at Chef, and I'm hoarse from talking a lot, um, having to do my job. But, uh, you know, Chef, we're all concerned with, with speed and doing stuff at scale. And we have a great example of that with John Casanova. That's his real name. We have a John Snow, and we got a John Casanova. There's all these cool names. Ken Langdon, not that cool. <laughs> So, uh, but John has been a system administrator for a long time. I've known him for the better part of two decades, and I was in an application team. John was in, he was a sysadmin, you know, HPUX, Red Hat certified, all these. He's, he was the go-to guy, and he taught me a lot of stuff, and when he left to go to Capital One, um, we kept hiring him back. Hey, can you come on the weekend and do a thing for us, because we need you. You're brilliant. He's awesome. So, real quick question, though. Who had a uh, flip phone in the debate, in the day? Who texted on a flip phone? What was it called? T9. You remember T9? What was the first word? If you wanted to type cool, what word came up first? Book. Well, John and I, we, we you know, sysadmins, we don't want to type and do, you know, we want to do stuff quick. So we were like, well, we'll just use book and that'll be cool. And so we'll just be, that'll, hey, that's book, man. And so we, so we, and then we decided we were going to do this new language. It's like, you know what? Every word that we can kind of come up with, that's kind of the first word, we'll start using that word instead. And no one know what the hell we're talking about. And so, well, you know, flip phones went away pretty quick because then we went to Blackberries and touchscreens. And so we didn't have enough time and we couldn't go viral because viral wasn't a thing yet. But, uh, you know, so we had book. And so please help me join, uh, help join me in welcoming the bookest dude in the world, John Casanova. Thank you, sir. All right, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, well, uh, welcome. Thank you guys for coming to my talk. And I've um, been asked a lot of questions about my arm all, the, all week, so I'll go ahead and get that out of the way. I don't really have a glamorous story, like I was defending the Hyatt from a, uh, an attack by the guys at Puppet Conf across the street. But the reality is it's not very exciting. I was doing a weightlifting competition at my uh, job. They do powerlifting events sometimes, and during the deadlift event, I said, all right, let's try, let's try that weight. And then my arm said, well, why don't we, what if we did surgery instead? And, and then <laughs> several months of physical therapy. So that's why I've been uh, walking around looking like a budget Robocop all week. So uh, my team, a uh, little background on me, as Ken mentioned, uh, I was a long time Unix and Linux administrator. Unix is, has been my deal for most of my life. And I joined Capital One about five years ago. I uh, joined the Chef team for, um, about six months after its inception, so I've been on it for about uh, four years now. And I'm the product owner, and basically that means uh, everybody else left the team. <laughs> so I've been on it the longest. I know the platform the best. And so I have two engineers that work with me. One of them's in the back row, Adam Linkus. And uh, we met him at ChefConf a couple years ago, and he came to work for us, and it's been a great addition to our team. So we are, we are an agile team, so uh, our name is FTL, of course, short for faster than light. And we manage the, chef, uh, the enterprise chef platform at Capital One. The broader organization that I work for is called Delivery Experience, and we manage all the enterprise CI CD tools at Capital One. So we have an enterprise chef platform, of course. We have Artifactory for binary repository, enterprise GitHub, and we have a um, Jenkins, a very enormous Jenkins deployment, and we use CloudBees Jenkins, so we have, managed, uh, we have support for that. So that's what we do. Uh, we are responsible for keeping these tools up and available because they are all uh, in the, the uh, critical path for all the pipelines at Capital One. And uh, we have a, um, so here are some of the things that I'm going to talk about in here today. Of course, I'm going to talk about Chef Server. And I'm going to talk about how we've architected our application in AWS to um, support Chef. And I'm going to go through an Elasticsearch migration that we went through last year. I'm going to talk about the pipeline uh, built around the Chef platform that we use to deploy uh, changes to it. I'm going to go through the performance testing, how we handled that in our pipeline, and how we use Inspect throughout our pipeline. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the release of Chef Client 14 at Capital One. So a little background on Capital One and AWS. We are full, uh, fully on board with getting out of our data centers. They decided that back in 2015. So I mean, pretty much a year after I joined, I had initially joined on an AIX building team. And um, 
I saw pretty quickly that, that that had a shelf life at Capital One, so I got out of that as quickly as I could. And so Capital One, all in on AWS, we're very far along that, that journey. Uh, we have, it's expected, if you're an engineer in public cloud at Capital One, that you get certified on AWS, so we have an enormous amount of certified engineers on AWS. So I think we, the last I heard, we, were the, the, we have the third most uh, engineers who are certified on it, and behind one of those being Amazon. So. We know AWS pretty well, and uh, that's our bag. I'm gonna use a term called rehydration, which uh, I, I assume this was proprietary to Capital One, but I did hear somebody mention it yesterday in a keynote. But I'm gonna use this term throughout the talk, and what that means is the way Capital One handles patching and security vulnerability remediation on the, um, on the operating system is every two weeks, they release a new set of base images. So Red Hat, Ubuntu, Windows, Amazon Linux, every two weeks we get a new AMI. And so you are not allowed to be on an AMI that's older than, uh, has a creation date of older than 60 days. So at a minimum of every 60 days, you are having to redeploy your entire application. And that kind of sets the tone for how we design all of our applications. They have to be fully automatable and able to be torn down and and rebuilt on a whim, which is you know, kind of the way things are going these days. So that's rehydration. Rehydration is just uh, re-releasing your stack on a newer AMI, tearing it down and, and, and uh, rebuilding it. So Chef at Capital One, um, when I joined the team, and um, it started around mid-2014, and we had Chef in three different data centers around the country. And when I joined the team in 2015, my first task was to get uh, Chef moved into AWS. And so we did that, that took about six months or so, and we used that architecture for uh, a couple of years that worked pretty well, and then uh, it had some limitations, which we kind of had to wait for AWS to catch up on some things. And then in 2018, uh, we released what we uh, is affectionately known at Capital One as Chef HA, so a full redesign of the architecture, and that's what I'm gonna go through here on these uh, next few slides. So that's a, a diagram of what the architecture looks like. Chef HA is a uh, multi-AZ, multi-region uh, application. Capital One resides primarily in US East 1 and US West 2. And so we have a, um, what, compromise, uh, what comprises one chef stack is an application stack running in East and an application stack running in West. We have a, we have two primary stacks that are customer facing. And by customer facing, I mean internal to Capital One, uh, not, not outside of it. But, so we have one prod stack and then one non-prod stack. And we have two primary DNS endpoints. So all the, uh, when you're coming in to either access the managed console or your clients are bootstrapping, you're hitting one of those two. We have a few other stacks that we use for internal team development and also a staging stack. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, the, for what the community is concerned with. There's only two, two stacks. And as far as the organizational structure for the artifacts, we use a flat organizational structure. So on the non-prod stack, there's a dev org and a QA org. And on the prod stack, there's just the prod org. And so all the artifacts go into those organizations. And in QA and prod, all the artifacts are frozen. So they cannot be overwritten. So if you make a change to a cookbook, you have to update the version in the metadata.rb and then push it. Otherwise, the, um, the Jenkins jobs, which facilitate the upload of the cookbooks to the chef server, they will deny your ability to push that artifact. Uh, I forgot to mention scalable. You know, the, these stacks, the way we design the chef servers, they're on the smallest possible EC2 instance that uh, chef server will support, which I, uh, I believe is the C5 extra large. And uh, it's just really, you need eight gigs of RAM to run Chef Server. We're not so much, uh, we use the compute cl instance class uh, for the instances. So at the very top, so I'm gonna go through this tier by tier. I'm gonna start with the blue tier and then hit the green tier and then the yellow tier. And as I mentioned, uh, blue tier where both the users coming in from their laptops or instances that are bootstrapping against Chef, they're gonna hit the one Route 53 endpoint and that Route 53 endpoint um, has two record sets associated with it, one for the east and one for the west. And behind those, um, behind those record sets are the endpoints for the application load balancers of the chef servers. So that's that little orange circle down there. 
we use a latency-based routing policy. So if you're coming in from west, you're going to get automatically routed down the west side of the stack, or, or to the west stack. And if you're coming in from east, you're going to go down the east side. Associated with the Route 53 record sets are Route 53 health checks. And they are pointed at CloudWatch alarms. And those CloudWatch alarms are looking at the amount of instances that are healthy in the target group of the application load balancer. If there are less than one healthy instance in that target group, that health check is going to fail, or the CloudWatch alarm will trigger, trigger, the health check will fail, and all the traffic will get routed down uh, the other side. So that is, um, that's the way we automatically fail traffic back and forth um, through the application layer, and it works very well. On the application tier, we have Chef Server EC2s in an auto-scaling group. And they, of course, are sitting behind the Chef Server application load balancer. And when I'm talking about this architecture, this is as it stood one year ago. I'm kind of setting the table for the changes that we made throughout uh, last year. We learned what, what went well and what didn't go well with this architecture. So the Chef Server EC2s, um, they're configured to send their Elasticsearch bound traffic to an Elasticsearch ALB, behind which sits another auto-scaling group for Elasticsearch EC2 instances. And we have a little utilities instance up there that does things like remove stale nodes from the Chef server and then adds users to the Chef server uh, when we have new users that need access to the application. And finally, the database tier. So I um, forgot to mention all the traffic that flows either across the region or between these layers that's all controlled by security groups. So we tightly control who, you know, who's able to go into um, each of these layers. So as far as the Chef servers connecting to the, uh, the database, they hit one Route 53 endpoint, which is primarily pointed at the, um, this master multi-AZ RDS Postgres instance. And so that Route 53 is pointed to that east endpoint for RDS. And he has an encrypted read replica in the opposite region, which is typically west. And so if we ever have to fail over, we promote this guy to master and then change the Route 53 endpoint to the West RDS, the newly promoted read replica that is now a master. And twice a year, we have to do a DR exercise where we, we either run entirely out of the West region for a week or, um, yeah, that's really what we do. So we, Chef is a, is a platinum level application, which means at Capital One that has an RTO or an RPO of uh, under 15 minutes. And so we can, we can, recover data and restore the application in under five minutes so we easily meet the platinum uh, resiliency. And that's important because all the applications that are needing to be either platinum or whatever, if they have a dependency, you know, if they're relying on Chef and Chef is not platinum, it's gold or bronze, whatever, they can't be platinum. So we cannot be the people that are, or we can't be the application that's preventing the, um, the, the application from getting to platinum. So. That's the expectation out of all of the, the enterprise tools. So GitHub, Artifactory, they all have to be platinum. Um, and of course, we have S3 buckets here. So whenever a new uh, Chef server comes up, maybe it scales up or we deploy a new auto-scaling group, he comes down and picks up the uh, secrets that are needed to be able to communicate with the database. So the private secrets.json, the pivotal.pem, we store those encrypted in an S3 bucket. And the Chef servers are able to pull that down at build time and then use that to configure themselves. So that is an overview of the architecture. And here's some of the troubles that we ran into, particularly around the Elasticsearch cluster that we were trying to maintain. We weren't very good at Elasticsearch when we started all this. We knew um, you know, we, this is the first time that we used external Elasticsearch and tried to manage it ourselves. And to be honest, we did it pretty poorly. Because our, our intent, our, what we were thinking would happen is when we rehydrate, and we bring in a new Elasticsearch auto-scaling group into the mix on a newer AMI. It would join the cluster of the existing one. So for a while, we would have six uh, EC2 Elasticsearch instances together, and they would distribute their shards across the cluster. And when it, um, once Terraform decided that the old auto-scaling group was ready to be taken down, it would terminate those instances, and we would lose data shards. And that wasn't great. So what we had to do to recover from that is every time that we spun up a new, every time we did the rehydration, we have to go and recreate the Chef Index. And that amounts to stopping the traffic to that region, blowing away the Chef Index, 
recreating it, and then re-indexing it. And that would take probably about 20 minutes because we had about 50 to 60,000 documents stored in that Elasticsearch index. So that's a big pain. So the goal was to be able to get away from that, and the solution was to get onto AWS Elasticsearch. And you might be asking, well, it was released in 2015. Why didn't you just do that in the first place? And it's a valid question. And the problem with that is that because it didn't have VP support, VPC support at the time, that meant that your Elasticsearch endpoint was an external IP address. And at Capital One, in order to access that, you have to go through a proxy. And fun fact, Chef Server does not support proxy. So in your chefserver.rb, there's no place to put a proxy setting and allow you to go access an external endpoint. So it was a, a bit of a godsend when in 2017, they finally released the VPC support for Elasticsearch which meant we could finally go ahead and use it. And so we spent, uh, we learned this pretty fairly on, fairly early on last year and started moving toward it as quickly as we could. And so in, in Q2 of 2018, we were able to get rid of the Elasticsearch load balancer and the auto scaling group and move over entirely to the domain. And that saved us a whole lot of time uh, particularly with the rehydration. So we no longer have to wait for an EC2 auto-scaling group to rehydrate. Now it's just the chef server auto-scaling group that we manage. And that, that AWS managed service has worked very well for us. If you've ever tried to configure this, um, if you're gonna use the Elasticsearch domain, chef, um, chef will provide you with a piece of software called the AWS signing proxy. And what this is used for is that for you to be able to restrict the access to your Elasticsearch domain, let's say you want only um, instances with a particular IAM role to be able to access the, the cluster or the domain, you have to sign every one of those requests that are sent up to Elasticsearch. And so, so that's what the AWS signing proxy is there for. You run it on every Chef server, and it intercepts all the Elasticsearch bound traffic, signs the request, and then sends it up to the, um, the Elasticsearch domain as otherwise you have to leave your manage your access policy wide open um, and security is not like a huge fan of that. So that is an integral part of running, uh, of working with the Elasticsearch domain. So that's what it looks like now. We were able to get rid of um, this whole, this little part right here. We no longer have to manage an elast a load balancer and a bunch of EC2 instances and it's much simpler. Okay, so now this is probably the, the biggest challenge that we ran into last year. And you know, this architecture sounds neat, we, we thought it was great, and what we found was that we started having incidents that would pop up randomly and uh, let us know about a pretty significant problem that we have. And that is what's called, uh, what we refer to as uh, index drift. So when you have instances that are bootstrapping, they're coming in from east, and they're gonna go down this side of the application stack, and you know, nodes are gonna check in, maybe they upload a cookbook, and it goes and hits the chef server and it gets indexed over here. It's not getting indexed over here. So this, this West Elasticsearch domain just was continually getting out of sync with the, you know, with the other domain, and ultimately the Postgres database, which is where really the source of truth that the Elasticsearch um, indexes are based off of. So we would, the way this manifested itself is that we would have application teams get a, get a hold of us and say, hey guys, our, our cookbooks aren't converging. You know, we're, we're not able to build our stack. And so we would look at it and we would look in our Nginx logs and we would see the API requests. So they're using Chef Search in their cookbooks. So they wanna find their other uh, nodes in their cluster by searching for anything that's sharing the same role and domain. So they use the Chef, Surf, uh, Chef Search functionality in their cookbook to accomplish that. And so we would see in our Nginx logs, we would see these API requests looping just forever and then never resolving. And then eventually the chef client times out and their application fails to build. So they would call us up, say what's going on, we would see this and then we would have to go in and re-index the, uh, re the Elasticsearch index on there. So that, that, that entails opening up an emergency change order you know, leadership finds out about it, they're not excited. And uh, it's about 20 minutes worth of, you know, we have to shut all the traffic down to one of these, you know, either side and then rebuild the Elasticsearch domain. So, 
you know, what's the, the first step when you realize like a critical problem with your architecture is, you know, you go into complete denial that there really is a problem. You, uh, we opened up a ticket with Chef. You know, we talked to Chef several times about this and say, guys, what, you know, what do we do about this? And they, they kind of kindly put it to us that, hey, you guys kind of did this to yourselves. You know, you architected yourself into a corner. And there's really, we don't, you know, Chef server is not designed to do what you're trying to do. And so we kind of had to figure out what do, what do we do about this? How do we fix this ourselves? Uh, because, you know, the, there was no real, you know, AWS is not to a place with Elasticsearch where they have any kind of uh, cross, um, any kind of replication, any kind of active, active Elasticsearch cluster. So the, the, the solution wasn't with AWS, and so we had to figure it out ourselves. And the first step to that was opening up the security group rules so that the chef servers could talk to the Elasticsearch domain in the opposite region. So the bare minimum, we need to be able to open up the traffic uh, to the other side. So that was our first step. And I contacted the guy who wrote the AWS signing proxy, and he no, he's no longer with Chef, but I, I looked and said, hey, here's, here's our problem. Um, what can you guys, you know, is, this, is it possible to modify the code and to be able to send the request to not just one endpoint, but two endpoints? And he kind of said, yeah, but it would be complicated. And so, I mean, I, I looked at the code and, you know, was quickly reminded of my ops background and uh, that was not happening that I was gonna be able to rewrite the thing. So one of my coworkers happened to find a, a, a product or, or an application written on, it was just available in somebody's public GitHub and it was called, it's called tproxy. And tproxy is a reverse proxy that sounded like it would do exactly what we needed it to do. tproxy will take in, uh, listen on a specific port and then send that traffic to two different locations. And so, what do you do when you find software on a public GitHub and uh, looks like it might work and you, you jam it into your production application as quickly as possible <laughs> and uh, for your, for your uh, multi-billion dollar company that relies on, on Chef to be up all the time. So yeah, not really. So we did, we, we tested this extensively. This is the command line for tproxy. So tproxy, you specify dash L to listen on port 9200. So instead of AWS signing proxy listening on 9200, we have tproxy listening on 9200. And then we can configure an A endpoint and a B endpoint. Those are basically said, hey, take the traffic in on 9200, send it to these two ports. And on these two ports, we have an AWS signing proxy that's pointed at the east Elasticsearch domain. And then port 9202 is going to send traffic to the opposite region, the, the west domain. And so in our chefserver.rb, we have the Elasticsearch uh, endpoint configured to be localhost 9200. And so that sends all, uh, tproxy intercepts all the Elasticsearch bound traffic and sends it off to 9201 and 9202. And that fixed our problem completely. What we did to make sure that the we watched the index drift on both sides as we wrote a shell script that basically looks at all the, the indices in the Postgres database, so nodes, clients, uh, roles, and environments. They exist in the Postgres database, and they also look, they exist in the Elasticsearch uh, index, index. And we, we, see we list out every single index ID in those, those, every document ID, and then we check for its existence in the Elasticsearch domain. And if it, we find something that isn't there, we write that out to a file. And so at the end of that run of that script, we get hopefully, you know, just a handful or maybe zero. Not, uh, we then send that number up to CloudWatch. And so we have a custom CloudWatch metric that tracks index drift on the east and west Elasticsearch domains. And for us, when we would normally have index drift of probably 10, 15, 20,000, you know, just constantly getting out of sync with the database. Now it's completely under control, and it's, you know, it's under, you know, in, in our non-prod stack, it's like, there's like two documents that are missing, and in the prod stack, there, you know, it's under 30. And so it's a huge improvement. So we implemented that at the end of last year, and we've not had a single incident where uh, a customer has come up to us and said, hey, we, our application can't come up, the chef cookbooks won't converge. And we've not had to re-index either of those Elasticsearch indices since then. So big win for us, and we sleep a whole lot better, and uh, 
we don't have to bug Chef about it anymore. <laughs> so a lot less tickets and hearing from us about that. Okay, I'm gonna talk about um, the pipeline now. So big push last year at Capital One was to get to what's called PAR, and PAR is short for pre-approved releases. And so if you develop your pipeline in a robust enough fashion and you satisfy all these different behaviors, all these different gates, you can get approved for your pipeline to be able to do releases during the day and not need the three-day lead time to create a change order, wait for it to get approved, and then do your release. So um, PAR is basically you're able to do your releases during the day whenever you want, and um, it'll take care of creating the change order and approving it for you. So this took us a better part of a year to go ahead and build all the things into our pipeline that needed to get us there. And so the first thing that we did, because we have a lot of teams, you know, GitHub, Artifactory, Jenkins, we all wanted to kind of take the same approach. And so we developed uh, what we call maturity tenants in reference to how we build out our pipelines. So um, I'll go through these. The, from a GitHub perspective, uh, we, we all use the same trunk-based um, approach to doing development, and we use a fork and pull model on our, for our branching strategy. So we just, in our GitHub repository for Chef and for Artifactory for Jenkins, we have one master branch, and we do not have um, separate feature branches. We fork the master uh, repo when we're ready to do a, a, a feature, and uh, then we create the branch out of our fork, and we immediately open a pull request back to the master branch. So all the teams are, are doing it that way, there's merits to, there's pros and cons to each, and, but that's, that's the way that we went. Chef HA was originally written with CloudFormation to do the deployment, and uh, we ended up going over to Terraform because the idea was that we were probably gonna try to look at multi-cloud, you know, and not be tied solely to AWS in case something went wrong there. We needed to be able to, not that you can take your Terraform template and drop it into Google and it just runs, but just the ability to understand the basic structure of how you would do uh, infrastructure automation in a different, uh, different cloud provider. So Terraform was the way that we went, and we do Chef Cookbooks for doing the application deployment. So in the user data section of a, uh, like a CloudFormation template or Terraform where you define all the bash steps that are gonna take place after your instance comes up, we don't want to have a big sprawling user data section that becomes unmanageable, and so we decided to use Chef Cookbooks to handle all the things that take place to deploy the application and then bring it up. As I mentioned, we use Jenkins, so what, what drives our pipeline is we use Jenkins multi-branch multi, multi pipeline jobs, and so we all have a Jenkins file that contains all the orchestration for the pipeline. And, uh, so a lot of that pipeline development is, is building out those stages within the Jenkins file, and uh, we, within, our, within our team, we developed uh, Groovy functions for the different stages of you know, what needed to happen. You know, Terraform may need to launch some things, and so we, we would be able to share those Groovy functions across the team and allow everybody else to leverage um, some existing code to do the same thing that needed to happen in theirs. And of course, in spec, uh, Inspect's been a great tool for all the teams to use to verify that their application got deployed as they wanted and, and built as it was supposed to. So at the end of every EC2 instance finishing its chef run, we go ahead and run the, uh, the Inspect tests and check for all, all, the, all the little things you wanna make sure that your application has taken care of. So on static analysis, the way we handle that is we have a Docker container that contains all these tools, so we ensure we're using the same version of the tools and you know, the same things are running uh, as part of static analysis. So the Jenkins, during the pipeline, the Jenkins agent will invoke the, uh, the Docker container and will run our code through those, those various tools to make sure that they come out okay. If they don't come out okay, the pipeline, bre the pipeline breaks and you start back over and fix your stuff. Functional testing. Um, so when we're doing development, uh, there are times where we want to launch infrastructure when we commit, uh, do a git commit, and there are times that we don't. So we may be modifying a readme file where we're not really needing to spin up infrastructure, or, and there's times that we do need to. And the way we handle that is a tool that, uh, called CPC that a contractor named Luke Hobbs wrote while he was working at Capital One. 
And what CPC allows us to do is it will parse our git commit message and then look for various flags that we have passed within the git, commis, uh, git commit message. So maybe we pass a dash C for create or dash D for delete. CPC will look at that git commit message and then accordingly set uh, environment variables in the Jenkins workspace. And our pipe, our uh, Jenkins, uh, Jenkins file is keying off various uh, environment variables to say, hey, they specified that they want to launch infrastructure. So just by our git commit message, we can, we can control whether or not we want to launch things within AWS, and that's been very handy for us. And of course, uh, I mentioned inspect testing and uh, Inspect tests are also going to be used later on in the, uh, when we get closer to the production lease release. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Performance testing within our pipeline. So one of the behaviors to get to par is that you have to have performance testing within, done within the pipeline. And this was kind of a tough thing to achieve with Chef because we want to test not only the managed console where all the users are going in to look at, look at their cookbooks, but we also need to be able to test bootstrapping and make sure that the stacks are gonna be able to handle the typical load uh, that's expected of them. So as far as the managed console, that was pretty easy for us. We used JMeter, and we just took one day's worth of uh, activity in the Nginx logs, so you know what, what people were doing in the console, logging in, maybe clicking on the environments tab, whatever. And we condensed a day's worth of uh, activity into one 15-minute test. That test runs, and then if we, if we meet the target response time, for that test, then that portion of the uh, performance testing stage passes. The tricky part was figuring out how do you simulate uh, bootstrapping. So I, I, our company was not really thrilled if we would spin up thousands of instances and have them all bootstrap to the uh, staging stack. And so that's very expensive and a lot of, and pretty time consuming. So the way that we handled this is there is a tool out there written by a gentleman at Chef named Jeremiah Snap. He wrote a tool called ChefLoad, which was written in Go, and it does exactly what you would need to do to be able to simulate performance testing. It, the tool itself is configurable. You can specify any, any number of nodes. I think we have ours set around to simulate about um, double or triple the load of our, of our non-prod stack. The way we approached it was we looked at the Nginx logs again, and Chef has a tool to look at your Nginx logs and tell you how many API requests per second that, uh, that Chef server was taking in. So we looked at a typical workday and tripled that number and said, okay, these are the, this is our target number of API requests that we want to meet. And then it was just a matter of taking the Chef load tool and playing with that until we simulated that exact load on one of our stacks. And so we created a Docker container from that, put the chef load tool on there, and then put the uh, a log stash tool as well to send our results to the uh, performance application called Hercules. And so during the pipeline, when it gets to the second phase of performance testing, it'll go in and fire off chef load, and we can simulate thousands of nodes bootstrapping for 15 minutes. So basically, we abuse our staging stack for 15 minutes and hope that it meets the uh, transactions per second and the response time that we, that we wanted to. So assuming those two items pass, the pipeline can then move on. We only do this during a merge to master. Obviously, this is not something you want to do every time you commit code and in, while you're doing development because then you sit there and wait for 30 minutes and while well, performance testing takes place. So this only happens on a merge to master. And so far, it's working out well. This is, this is part of what got us to par, is finding out how to, how to make that happen. So chef load, very neat tool if you need to figure out how do you simulate a whole bunch of uh, nodes bootstrapping. So par release. So what happens when we're do, ready to do a, a production release? So we, we tag all of our releases um, in GitHub, and we have a release management tool called Artemis. And Artemis is when we are ready to do a production release, we go ahead and uh, we run a production job that, that lets Artemis know, hey, this git, this git commit, we're ready to go fire this off into production. And what Artemis is gonna do is it's gonna go look and see are there inspect tests created for this release and did they pass? And so we store those, those um, the inspect tests were generated during the deployment to non-prod. And so if that all ran well, we, we upload those tests to S3, and then Artemis will reference those and say, okay, these guys proved 
that this change looks good to go to production. So it'll then go ahead and create a release for us. It'll create a change order and approve it and then send an email back to us that says, hey, your release is ready for, uh, your release is ready for your approval. And I'll go in and I'll hit approve and it'll start the deployment. It kicks off a job that goes in and does a regional deployment. So we're, we're obviously not wanting to go update west and east at the same time, because that's kind of going all in. And uh, we kind of want to make sure that we do one region successfully first before moving on to the other one. So we'll go in and update the full, the west stack entirely. And assuming all those inspect tests pass, we have a lot of other checks to make sure that the stack is healthy. And then once that's cleared, it'll go ahead and move on to the east stack. And uh, that, whole, that whole process takes probably about an hour to fully uh, update both sides. And so we got approved for this back in December. We've done several releases this year. And uh, so now we, we release during the day with full confidence and uh, have, not been, have not been bit by it yet. But um, I'll say that this, the way this is running outside of those little incidents where we had Elasticsearch troubles, um, We've not had a single platform-wide issue. And uh, my, my coworkers back there knocking on, on wood, but understandably. But it's, it's rock solid. I mean, this thing just runs. We sleep well at night. And it's just very rare that we, get, we hear anything out of, out of the chef stack. So we're, we're very fortunate. I mean, that's a combination of chef having written their software well, and then um, just the way that we've deployed it, it works, works really well. Chef Client 14. So the way that we handle bootstrapping and the Chef Client is uh, we, bake the AI, we bake the client into the AMI. So Windows has it, uh, Ubuntu, Red Hat, they all, all, the, all the base images come with Chef Client baked into it. And right now, Chef Client 13 is the one, the default one in the AMI. And so we moved to that last year. We, it's tough when you have such a huge Chef community and all these different applications that rely on Chef and you tell them, hey, Chef, Chef Client 12 is end of life. You guys need to get off of it. We can't pull it entirely out of the AMI because there are just some teams who go, we tried. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't adjust our cookbooks to work with Chef Client 13. And so you kind of just have to say, OK. Uh, we kind of put the onus on them to, to um, just understand that they're not going to get support with Chef Client 12 if they continue to run it. But we have to make it available to them. So the way we handle that is in our bootstrap scripts, we give them an optional parameter to, if they pass the CC12 flag in their, in their bootstrap line, it'll go in and pull the Chef Client 12 down from Artifactory, uninstall the Chef Client 13 on the operating system, and then put Chef Client 12 on it. So that's how, we, that's how we released Chef Client 14 at the end of last year. So we now have an optional CC14 parameter that they can pass and uh, pull that client down on there. And so typically on a yearly basis, we'll release a new Chef Client. And uh, it's very slow to get teams to adopt. You know, they've either, they've got to have motivation. You know, maybe there's something, some functionality that the current Chef Client doesn't provide that they want to use. Or, like what we did with Chef Client 12, we kind of had to threaten them that we were going to take it away. And that kind of got them motivated to uh, the majority of the community to move off of Chef Client 12. So probably, I don't know how you guys would, would, would manage it um, in a smaller organization. Like uh, we have a UK Chef division, which is separate from us. Um, so they kind of do their own thing. But they, they use the Chef HA architecture they just started this year. But they, they have a little bit easier time getting, my, getting um, the applications migrated off of uh, Chef Client and onto a newer one. So they're able to completely take away the older Chef Clients and then get them onto the new ones. So yeah, it's, it's a challenging um, thing to try to deal with. But at the end of the day, we, just, we, we put it on the teams to try to keep on a uh, you know, more current version of Chef. But it's, it's, a, it's a slow process. So that's, that's the end of the demo. Do you guys have any questions I can answer about this? I did a, a similar talk last year. Um, so if you want a more, uh, it's on YouTube. If you want to go into more detail about the, uh, the application architecture, I went um, more into detail about it last year.
Hey, John, this is sort of a detailed question, but yeah. in one of your later slides, you talked about your load testing, and you said you only do that when you merge to master. Yeah. How often are you merging to master? Oh, probably once every couple of weeks or so. We usually, at the very least, every 60 days, we've got to redeploy the application entirely. So we'll, we'll test that out in dev and then move to staging. And um, um, usually there's a merge to master involved in there somewhere. But it's not a, it's not a daily thing. It's probably not even a weekly thing. Because right now, Chef's kind of in a, in a BAU mode. There's really not a whole lot of new development. Um, the pipeline that we developed last year, we're all going to have to move to a common pipeline at Capital One. So we're going to have to kind of get away from the pipeline that we wrote eventually and, and get on to the one that Capital One wants everybody on. So that's another challenge. But as far as this platform goes, there's really not a whole lot that we need to do to it at this point. So we're just keeping it running for now. No, I got, uh, well, I got a lot of questions about the architectures uh, that you have there because what you have is almost similar to what uh, my company is going through. However, rather than going, I mean, I don't know, maybe I have two if it's uh, basic. One, looking back, how will you start this project? Is there like a, a level where it's like, okay, we should do this piece first, this piece second? Uh, because we're using Elasticsearch Jenkins, we're using, uh, we're getting to Chef, we're just starting Chef now. Yeah. Um, but uh, if that's too difficult a question, I guess my other question would be, uh, the, the, based on the current architecture, uh, architecture you have now, how would you, what do you see being changed, streamlined, modified uh, for future uh, endeavors? Okay, yeah, good question on the first one, because it's, you know, how do you go from nothing to that? And honestly, it's, it's, you just start from you know, the very top. You know, you, we take Terraform and we build a, um, you know, a load balancer module and we just try to get the chef server load balancers up. And then once we have those up, then we'll start developing a, um, you know, an auto scaling group module that we want to get the, the goal there is to just get the chef servers to join the load balancer and basically make, maybe just have them install chef server RPM, you know, as part of when they come up. And then from there, you start trying to develop the cookbooks that are going to handle the installation of Chef, you know, how it handles the secrets management of pulling the secrets down from S3, and then installing Manage. And so eventually you get to a point um, where, you know, you're going to have to in parallel have Elasticsearch, you know, a, an Elasticsearch module to come up so that, you know, you, you, you can't get the Chef server cuddle reconfigured to work unless you've got a database and you've got Elasticsearch available. So kind of in parallel. Maybe you stand up uh, manually an RDS instance that you can use until you have the time to automate that development, you know, through Terraform and have that automated. So it's it's a, you know, bit by bit you kind of put that all together and then you start seeing what's working and then what's not working. The uh, the other question that you asked, remind me again, what was? Uh, basically, uh, what do you see? Uh, oh. Yeah, I think the biggest thing right now would be if Amazon released, if RDS, Postgres, if they supported like a multi-master and we were able to get away from a read replica because right now that's, that's a pain. We have, a, we have to fail it over. We have to promote the other read replica. And uh, trying to build some kind of detection system of when is it the right time to promote the read replica? What, what's, how do you define a failure that is rock solid that you know confidently it's the right time to, to promote the read replica and go over there. So that's all. Um, there's not a great solution for that right now. You, you know, nobody's figured that out at Capital One yet. And uh, so, yeah, multi-master RDS would probably be the biggest win from the architecture. And all the gymnastics that we do with Elasticsearch, it, you know, it works really well. But if there is a native way that AWS could handle it, you know, we wouldn't have to be running, you know, random software that we found out on public GitHub, but it's working for now, but definitely ways that it could be improved. You know, we just kind of have to wait for AWS to mature a little bit more and come out with these things, and it'll come out eventually. How do you guys manage your users? Is it a 
So like users accessing Chef? Yeah, the, that's kind of a two-part uh, solution. So there's people who need to access the Manage console to be able to get in and look at artifacts. We have, um, we have LDAP groups where people can request membership to them, and then we have cron jobs that run that query those LDAP groups and query the Chef server database to see if those users exist. If they don't, it'll go ahead and create them. The other side to that is managing the user's ability to upload artifacts to the Chef server. So we have, on all of our Jenkins masters, all the Jenkins masters, they come with Chef upload jobs on them. And so who has access to upload to the production Chef server is defined by who has the production Jenkins access. And then they're allowed to run the upload job and then move the artifact to production. Same with dev. So it's really, it's ultimately, it's LDAP controlled. So you also have uh, a user, I mean, uh, you provide access to users to be able to upload artifacts to Chef server. Yeah, because we don't, we don't want to give knife access to everybody, and that would be awful. And so we, those knife keys are tightly controlled only the Jenkins jobs are able to access them and pull them down from S3. And so it's ultimately LDAP. If you have the ability to run that job, the job has the ability to go get the keys it needs to push the artifact. Are you guys running an internal supermarket at all? Or are you yes. Artifactory. We, we had a private supermarket. We used Chef Supermarket software for a while, and then that was, that was annoying to rehydrate. It was clunky. And so we moved it into Artifactory. Yes, and so and then, and then it's any, whenever somebody runs a production upload job, so they upload their artifact to the Chef server, they, um, it'll also put it into Artifactory automatically for you. We'll probably do one more. Uh, how are your app teams managing like secrets in their cookbooks and things? Data bags. Uh, there's no secret, just, just straight up data bags? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few ways they can do it. Um, data bags is one. We have, um, the right way to do it is we have a tool called Chamber of Secrets, which uses HashiCorp Vault. Okay. So it's, ideally, they're storing them in there, and then during the Chef run or Jenkins, it's going to interact with, uh, with that vault, pulling them out of there. And all the nodes have the same shared secret? Then. All the nodes are... I think you talk about secret zero, so you gotta go fetch secrets from somewhere else. Where's the, the initial secret? Okay, like for Chef Server platform or for the application like teams? Encrypting the data bags, like that shared secret. Okay, are you, do you mean the application teams or how are we for, for the Chef platform? Yeah, like on your server nodes, like uh, you need a shared secret to decrypt the data bag. Um, storing in KMS, okay. we'll use KMS to decrypt them. Okay. okay. I may not have answered that as well as you'd like. I'm happy to talk to you about it after the talk. Come on. Secrets okay. are hard. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you, guys.